Ottawa. This has been a challenging year for our community. There's no question about that. And throughout this year, as we have been grappling with the coronavirus pandemic, important decisions have had to be made. City government has continued to function, even as there has been so much change in behavior, in activity, in communication in our city. So today we want to provide you with an update to connect with your elected officials. We are doing a series of ward updates one-on-one -on -one interviews with city councillors where we will talk about the issues arising from the coronavirus pandemic that directly affect you, your families, and your neighbours. We'll talk about some of the success stories during this pandemic, people rising to the occasion to help their neighbours and to thrive in this environment. And we'll talk about other important decisions that City Hall is facing as a result of the pandemic and on other files. My guest today is Riley Brockington, who is the City Councillor for Ward 16, River Ward. Riley, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mark, for having me. Appreciate it. And how are you? How have you been through this pandemic? Uh, what impact has it had on you and your family and your team at City Hall? Well, it's not every day you live through a worldwide pandemic. Um, it has been challenging, no doubt, particularly in the early months uh, in March when you when we all observed and witnessed the closure of schools and businesses, uh, flights, planes no longer uh, flying. It was a lot to take in. And certainly in the beginning, I, I personally went through a state of denial, not believing the true impact of how bad this pandemic was worldwide, but also affecting our own city. So it was a bit of a transition. Thankfully, spring came and um, able to get our sea legs and really work with our residents right away to make sure their basic needs were being met for those who were shut in or not mobile, not able to travel, that they were still getting groceries or getting the medical appointments. Uh, but we've been very busy my office team are all working at home remotely i've tried to remain here at city hall and, and continue to work to have that that balance between home and work um, but like all my colleagues on council it's been a challenge but our priority are our residents to make sure people are being taken care of what do you think some of the lessons are arising from the first few months of this pandemic how the city has handled it how the community has responded what are your observations on that? Well, it truly takes a team, an integrated team, to address all the issues that we have. And to the city manager's credit, a number of ad hoc groups and task force were created to really look at community and social needs, the most vulnerable people in the city. So very happy in that regard. And a lot of the community organizations that deal with at-risk populations have stepped up, including in River Ward, family houses in some of our social housing communities and other agencies who, again, are really concerned about the most vulnerable to make sure that they're being taken care of. So there are always lessons learned from events like this. No doubt there'll be, uh, once this is passed, a lot of reflection on what can be done better. but. Certainly, I'm very impressed and proud of how Ottawa has come together from the very top to very local grassroots organizations. Um, it was different at the beginning. I think we really now have found a way to live with the pandemic as best we can and go about our business, but there are certainly needs out there that continue. What are your thoughts as we move into a new phase with kids being back at school and some people returning to work uh, and those kinds of things going on? Uh, there, there's also some things happening in another direction as well as the weather gets cooler, then people won't necessarily be on patios as much. Uh, so restaurants will have to adapt yet again. Uh, give me a sense of, of what you're feeling as we move into autumn about how we're managing this pandemic and how things are about to change. Well, I'm not going to lie, I'm concerned uh, as you get more people inside, all the statistics that we've received and information is we're certainly going to see more cases. I think we have to be reasonable 
in our reaction to the case rise. I think we have to isolate people who are positive or show symptoms right away. And the, the contact tracing and eliminating people who have been exposed from the general population is critical to avoid sort of a mass spread of, of this virus. So I think people have to understand that additional cases are to be expected. I think September is gonna be a true test month and indicate how well we get through the autumn and winter. But I, you know, I'm really opposed to the, the mass closures that we saw at the beginning of the pandemic. Again, we, we cannot, um, I think, get through another round of business closures. I know a number of business owners who are on thin ice right now financially, and that would just eliminate their business to be closed again for any period of time. And I do acknowledge that the, the closures, the school closures in the spring were very hard on many students and their families. And I'm not a fan of remote learning. I'm, I think remote learning is better than no learning, but I still think it's very challenging for a number of students. There are significant advantages to being in school. That's why medical professionals have endorsed a back to school plan. But I also live in reality and there are gonna be some challenges this fall and we have to be ready to tackle them straight on. And what can we do about supporting the business community? I know there have been a lot of efforts to encourage people to shop local. Uh, it's kind of an interesting dynamic as we, we don't necessarily want people going out too much, but we also don't want businesses to suffer. Uh, this has largely been, uh, there's been a lot of support from the federal government. It's largely been their mandate to kind of support business, but what can we do at the city level to help businesses? Well, first, Mark, I just want to applaud that what I've observed and witnessed in local businesses as far as adherence to uh, the direction from Ottawa Public Health by businesses has been excellent and by patrons in those businesses has been very good. So they have stepped up the business owners. They have modified the interior of their establishments to adhere to those directions and, and guidelines from OPH. And I wanna applaud them in that regard. But people have to understand how important local businesses are to the local economy, how many people are employed, and they're the backbone of many communities. And if you have an opportunity to shop in a big box national store or multinational store or a mom and pop shop that sells exactly the same goods that you need, think about the impact that your dollars will have on these small businesses. We really do need to promote them, the city, as, as much as possible to shop local, shop within your community. Um, they are struggling. Uh, they're trying to get through this as well. And yes, some have modified their service delivery. There was a lot of um, online ordering, certainly the number of online purchasing stats that I've seen have skyrocketed through the spring and early summer when you compare them to last year. Um, but we need these small businesses in our communities. They're, they make our communities vibrant and they make our communities um, diverse, not just residential. Um, so we all need to recognize this and shop local. And what about people at risk in our community? Uh, tell me a little bit about what's been happening to the disadvantage to the homeless and how we need to adapt to uh, the pressure that they're under. Uh, you know, there are people who are already struggling in our community and this has only made things work. Exactly. Um, well, there's there's sort of a citywide initiative and then there's initiatives in, in Riverward citywide, certainly. Uh, there's a recognition that people who are in shelters, for example, close confines that the city has tried to take uh, single people or families outside of shelters and spread them out. So there are a number of hotels that are being used uh, in the city for that purpose. Uh, abutting Riverward at the Jim Durrell Arena, we have uh, relocated a number of men from men's shelters to the arena, much more, you know, arena is obviously different than a hotel, but they are getting provided better opportunities to, you know, be socially distant from one another. Um, the Travel Lodge Hotel, on Carling Avenue in, in Carlington, right across from Westgate has been a family shelter and a number of families have been removed from there to a hotel in Canada to give them, again, more opportunities to be uh, physically distant. Um, 
But no, the city takes this very seriously. And as I said, there's a uh, task force that looks particularly at the social and community needs that exist, that people who are vulnerable um, are at a higher risk of contracting or, uh, the, the virus. And so there's a lot of effort and focus and resources that are being invested across the city, but particularly for the most marginalized. So it's it's quite serious. I'm pleased with the efforts that the city has undertaken and they continue to listen and, and modify their plans, both within particular wards, but also across the city. Throughout this pandemic, there have been examples of heroic behavior of people really supporting others. Uh, I know in every ward in this city, that's been the case. Can you share some examples of what you've witnessed in Riverwood? Small things like people knitting masks that they're donating to hospitals. Um, we have our family houses in, in the social housing complexes that have remained open. And I, I really do want to underline my strong appreciation and admiration for the volunteers and the staff in our family houses, but particularly the food banks that stay open and the hot meals that they provide throughout the day. I've been collecting simple things, Mark, like egg cartons, used egg cartons that families use. I've been collecting them throughout the ward to give them to the social housing uh, houses so they can provide fresh eggs as part of their food bank program. But in, in the Caldwell Carlington community in particular, as I said at the Travel Lodge, we've had a number of community agencies come in to provide multiple hot meals or package meals that can be picked up, brought back to your room for people. I was at the Caldwell Family Center last week during the lunch hour and they serve hundreds throughout the day at lunch. It's about 150. These centers have not closed. These centers have acknowledged and realized that in the most pressing times, they need to stay open, that there really are no other community resources that will come in and do the work that they've done. So I'm, I've been very impressed. You know, these volunteers are putting their own health at risk by serving others. Obviously, they do take precautions with PPE and, and other initiatives, but I, I can't say enough about how much I appreciate and acknowledge the great work they do normally outside of a pandemic, but have really pulled up their socks and served the community well. And I'm, I'm very, very pleased. Riley, what's your sense of uh, what has permanently changed as a result of this pandemic and the lockdown surrounding it and what things are going to go back to normal? I know that's a tough question and it's early, but, but what is your sort of first impression of all of that? Well, I mean, yeah, I, I don't like the phrase the new normal that this is because this, there's nothing normal about a pandemic. What we're trying to do is is modify our, our life to to live with it. Um, certainly, there's a lot of talk about what the office will look like after the pandemic or during the pandemic, obviously, as, as people are slowly asked to come back to work, but what will office like be like after the pandemic? Will there be more opportunities to work at home? Will employers provide resources to staff to modify their homes to work at home? I know people in River Ward who have actually sold their homes within the last few months because they want more space. They see uh, themselves working at home, so that's quite interesting. Um, public transportation. There's going to be a huge impact on public transportation in this city if people who normally have commuted to the office or to university uh, by bus or LRT who decide to stay home. That is going to have a, a we're going to have a significant con a conversation in the city about the future of transit, the future of expanding the transit system, spending billions of dollars if the future volumes of riders. Uh, does not continue. So it's those types of things and certainly the business community, uh, whether expensive storefronts to operate as part of the future landscape or whether there'll be significant uh, evolution towards online. Certainly online shopping exists now, but um, if I'm thinking about opening a storefront, is it does it make financial sense to spend the money for that physical presence versus an online presence. So I, I think those conversations started a while ago 
And uh, the pandemic, I think, has brought everything to the forefront and is going to force some, some major decisions to be taken over the next little while. Just on the issue of uh, transportation and transit, uh, you, you brought something up there, which I think is a fair question, and that is, should we continue to spend billions of dollars on public transit and expanding the light rail system if fewer people are going to use it in right. the future, um, if more people are going to work from home, if congestion is not going to be as much of an issue? So what is your thought on that? Because we're already pretty heavily committed to this multi-billion dollar system. Yeah, I'm not suggesting for one second that the phase two of LRT stop. I'm completely on board. Councils made that decision. Construction has started uh, many months ago. But what I am alluding to, Mark, is that we have a serious conversation about phase three. Do you uh, proceed with phase three to the further west end of the city? Uh, you really have to do a smart analysis on what the long term impacts are going to be. And I think taxpayers expect that. But also there are other major road um, commitments that the city is looking at through our transportation master plan. And again, uh, we've just seen last week that the current transportation master plan that's being reviewed is going to be delayed. And it's going to be delayed because studies that were supposed to happen in 2020 that need traffic volumes, real time traffic volumes for modeling and other analysis just just isn't there. We, we don't see the traffic volumes right now on the road. So if you're going to refresh your TMP, you need real numbers and not pandemic numbers. So that's an interesting uh, fact that we've seen recently as well. But no, I, I really do think we have to take a breath and understand what the short, medium and long term impacts will be. I hope the long term impacts resemble pre pandemic, to be honest. I think we I hope we I hope we do go back to as much as normal as possible. But I also acknowledge that there are going to be different ways that employers and employees work and function. And I think universities will be under some pressure to look at online possibilities as well for their students. Um, so that all has to be factored in as well. I, I just think the city has to be cognizant of this. And we're, when we're ready to spend some big money on big projects, we have to be ready to rationalize and explain that to taxpayers that in the long term, this investment is wise and needed. Just before we leave transportation, uh, I know a lot of people have expressed concern about traffic patterns recently and people speeding. Uh, that was an issue before the coronavirus. Uh, in some cases, it's been in, on some roads, it's been even more of an issue during the pandemic because the roads have been so open, people have been traveling even faster. Um, what, what's your opinion on where we stand in the fight against speeding and, and making the roads safer? We're losing, Mark. It's a battle that we haven't come close to winning. And I, I think we fail to acknowledge how bad the problem is. And certainly with the previous police chief, Chief Bortolo, one of his top three priorities as a chief was traffic and road safety. He never put the resources uh, in that were necessary to address this seriously. Certainly under Chief Slowly that we have now, there's, there's a operation, I think it's called Overwatch where for the past few months, uh, teams have been out and uh, addressing a whole number of issues, including street racing and speeding and, and other items. And I've asked for stats. I, you know, their press releases are great. Their numbers look impressive. But I said, how do you compare these numbers and this focus to previous years? And I have not been able to get that data because I want to see whether there's a net impact or not. Street racing at night is real. We have arterial roads in my ward, like every other ward where, whether it's Riverside or the airport parkway, Hunt Club, uh, you know, Fisher, Maribel, where uh, repeatedly uh, we hear from residents about uh, the street racing uh, at night, but also during the day. And um, it's dangerous and is very frustrating because you know, my big focus as a counselor is the safety, residential safety, road safety, recognizing that vulnerable user, users are at risk. And um, 
it, what we see in auto is excessive. That's why I was a huge proponent of the speed technology, went to Queens Park to testify to get this. Luckily, it's rolling out now in the city this, uh, this season. So we're gonna see the, the stats and the data once that gets rolling, but we're losing the battle. We really are losing the battle. And I wanna see more attention and resources, not just by the OPS, but by the city and how we design streets, how we redesign streets when streets get rebuilt and a greater community-based focus on making our streets safer. Something else that uh, is an implication, obviously, of, of the coronavirus pandemic is, this, is the impact that it's having on the city's finances. And I, I wanted to hear your thoughts on how we resolved some of the shortfalls in the budget. There's a $192 million budget deficit that's effectively been created uh, because of lower transport, uh, transit revenues and other factors. Uh, you're going to get some support from the federal and provincial governments, but that's not going to cover all of it. So what do we have to uh, consider going forward? Higher taxes, cutting in some areas? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, raising taxes is not my first option. It never has been and it never will be. Uh, thankfully, the federal and provincial governments have recognized the significant impact COVID has had on municipalities. We did receive a, a large uh, contribution recently, about $130 million, about two thirds of what our estimated uh, budget deficit for 2020 has been projected to be. And more money may be coming. They're saying, look, we are going to give you some upfront money now and once you sharpen your pencils and refine the impacts that this will have there will probably be a phase two for those funds but the 2021 budget will not be a fun process the city will have to seriously look at spending that it has and and there have been attempts throughout 2020 to be more tight with with multiple budget lines i don't think it's going to be a 192 million dollar deficit and speaking to a number of general managers there's some indication that they were perhaps a little more uh, liberal with some of their numbers and and again things are going to be tightened up so that's promising as well but uh, Mark, like I said, I, I don't believe you should tax your way out of tough times. I think you need to look at the spending that this $4 billion organization has and make some tough decisions because my residents can't afford after this year, many of them out of work to pay more in their property taxes. I think we hold the line on a 3% upper limit. There's certainly a number of needs in the city that continue to need to be addressed, but I've never been supportive of raising taxes as a first option. I wanted to talk about Mooney's Bay, the beach and the park there, because uh, I know that uh, it has become a gathering point during the pandemic. Lots of people have been gathering there, and I know a lot of them do it at a distance, and, and it's yeah. safe, but there's always risk when you're bringing people together like that. So uh, what, what's your, what are your thoughts on that, and, and how do we strike the right balance? Well, certainly Mooney's Bay Beach and Park has been in the news uh, this year. Canada Day, they saw so many people, the, the park had to be closed down uh, late at night. But I, I do see Mooney's Bay as a good news story. This is not a, a local city park. This is a regional park, probably the most visited in the city of Ottawa. Um, and, you know, 80, 84 acres. There's so much for families to do here. And it really is, has become a destination uh, in this pandemic um, with so many uh, opportunities uh, at museums or other places closed in the spring and early summer, families had limited options of where to go. And of course the park and beach is free and there are multiple amenities within the park uh, to enjoy. And it's great to see, I live very close, so I'm in the park frequently and I love to see the families there um, for the most part, what I witness is a proper physical distancing. It hasn't always been like that. There have to be, uh, there have been bylaw officers in the park and when the beach opened, beach staff reminding uh, visitors uh, of the importance of physical distancing. But I think people get it um, and people have been respectful. Certainly, you may recall the city had those circles in the parks at the beginning of the summer that people thought were in a unique uh, idea and, and they liked those but 
Mooney's Bay Park is huge and uh, people are spreading out and enjoying it and will continue to enjoy it. But, you know, with the closure of Britannia Beach this summer, with the, the beach being dredged and some work there and the beach itself being closed, we knew Mooney's Bay was going to be busier this year. We knew there'd be more visitors, even though the festivals that we see in the area were not happening. It has consistently been a busy year. And the beach staff, the lifeguards, the maintenance staff have done a really good job at keeping the park and beach clean. We've had so many more visitors. There's been a lot more garbage and recyclables that have to be taken care of, and they've stepped up and done a great job. Our city continues to grow, and there are still big decisions to be made about growth in uh, even in a pandemic. And one of the consequences of that growth is we're seeing approval for and applications for uh, a number of different high-rise buildings, some of them close to transit. Uh, how do you feel about that, particularly as it impacts your ward? Well, the ship keeps sailing. Uh, pandemic or no pandemic, we continue to have uh, people coming to the city, uh, families are, are increasing in size, and people, some people want to downsize and others want to move into this great city. So, you know, we're seeing a net increase of our city's population in excess now of 10,000 per year. These people have to live somewhere and so the market has to respond and housing continues to be built in this city. Um, I think it's great. I, I strongly support a high density near rapid transit stations. I think all transit way and LRT stations should see high density around them to make it easy for people not to own a car and get on the LRT or transit way to go about their business in this city. And that is basically a policy of the city that we will facilitate opportunities to make that happen. Um, obviously, that, that comes with discussion with the city, but we recently yeah. approved a growth strategy for this city as part of the official plan right. review. And that there was a great discussion, uh, many, many hours uh, at City Hall on that. But we recognize right. that the city is going to grow tremendously and we have to have those policies in place. All right. Riley Brockington, I appreciate you joining us for this ward update. Thank you so much, and uh, I, good luck to you and your constituents. Thanks for your time today. Thank you for the opportunity. Much appreciated. And that concludes our ward update for Ward 11, River Ward. Thank you for watching.